Welcome to our session on the 30 most misinterpreted words in American legalese. And this is subjective, of course. Probably you would come up with another top 30. But I've just been thinking over the years about how certain words are used one way in normal conversation and a special way by lawyers. And when I was first interpreting in court, I was always confused about what they meant in that context, especially like if you always work in criminal court and then suddenly you're in a family court case, they have their whole new set of special words that they use differently and you have to get used to it in each different type of law. And so I have asked my friend and colleague, uh, Miguel Leon, uh, to be a co-host today because I think that when you're talking about uh, language, human language and terminology, it makes more sense if you use it in conversation than if you study it by yourself. And so Miguel and I are going to kind of have a conversation as we go through this list right here and we're each going to explain certain terms and talk about them and hopefully that that format will um, help you to remember the terms better and uh, recognize them when they come up. Now, a lot of these, especially those of you who have been interpreting for a long time, a lot of these will be familiar, um, and maybe some of them will be new to you or you hadn't thought about different connotations of the word in new context. So I'm gonna put the link to the survey one more time in there for people who are just joining us. That's just a survey where you can request a certificate of attendance if you want it and give me a little information about your languages and so forth. Um, but I'd like to introduce uh, Miguel at this time. Uh, Miguel and I met probably 10 years ago. We've interpreted together in court, like in the um, municipal court and the criminal courts here in Travis County, Texas. And he's from Mexico. He was uh, an engineer before he moved here and became an interpreter. Um, so Miguel, uh, give us the highlights. Okay. Well, I'm still an I'm still I'm still an engineer. I haven't lost that, uh, but I'm not a practicing engineer. But yes, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I mean, I hope uh, you enjoy the, the discussion we're going to be having. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, when I first uh, started reviewing I mean, the, the list, uh, I laughed. I mean, because there's a lot of words that, that uh, yeah, I, I use them naturally in both settings, using the right settings in each case, but uh, without really paying much attention to the fact that, uh, that other people were not using the words in the way that they were supposed to be used. So it is going to be uh, interesting uh, and we'll probably have a lot of fun with it. All right. Thank you. Um, the uh, Just before I put up the PowerPoint, I want to give one more link to you guys here in the chat. Uh, this is a free webinar. You know, a lot of interpreter continuing ed costs like $30, $50 an hour. We do some of these sessions for free because it's fun to just have more of a casual atmosphere. We like chatting and meeting people, but also it's a fundraiser for different organizations each month that we support. And this month um, I'm asking that if you find this useful and you have 10 bucks to contribute to a worthy cause, I recommend uh, Raices, which is an organization that helps immigrants and um, victims of uh, trafficking and so forth to get uh, legal, legal aid. And so there's a link in there. You can give a $5, $10, $20 donation. Anything would be much appreciated. Um, and now to get started, I am going to see if I can share the right screen every time it's a challenge. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you can see my PowerPoint. Yeah. All right. Yes. OK, thank you. So uh, here's just the home page for RAICES, which stands for the Refugee and Immigrant Center for Education and Legal Services. A voluntary donation would be much appreciated and thank you those who have already given. And if you don't have any money to give, that's fine. I mean, what you do in your job is also of service to the same kinds of populations. And so everybody here is giving of their life if they can't give of their money today. So thank you for that. Um, the agenda today, we're gonna to talk about uh, the problem of uh, words that are used these ways, uh, the solution, then we're gonna go over each of the 30 words in turn with example sentences of the different meanings. And then at the end, there's a test. Don't worry, the test is not graded. It's more of a group review to see if everybody um, learned each of the words. So the problem is that uh, words in general have multiple meanings and every word can be translated different ways. Lawyers and judges use words in special ways that real people don't. Uh, excuse me if you're a lawyer or a judge. <laughs> I'm kidding when I say you're not a real person. I mean a regular person, a non-lawyer. A non <laughs> uh, 
And then if you are new to the court setting, maybe you're mostly a translator or mostly a medical interpreter, or you're just sort of dabbling in the legal field. Some of these words, when you first hear them, are confusing. So we're going to go over some important ones to start out with. Um, here's a little example of the kind of confusion that might come up if you're at a deposition and the bilingual attorney knows some Spanish, I'm a Spanish interpreter, so that's my easiest example, and asks, hey, how do you say this word in Spanish? And you give the most common translation, and then the lawyer tries to use it in a sentence, then it might turn out to be a totally wrong connotation of the word. Um, a money order in Spanish is not a dinero orden, that doesn't really mean anything. It's like a bad Google Translate version, and that'll confuse the client who only speaks Spanish. And so if, if, as you get more experience, when somebody asks you how to say this in your other languages, you think of all kinds of different ways to translate it or interpret it, and the, the appropriate response is in what context. In fact, that is like my life motto, in what context. If we were all going to go out drinking together and get tattoos to commemorate our friendship, they would be Tattoos, matching tattoos that said, in what context? <laughs> because that is what binds us together. We are in the in what context business. That determines the words that we use. So here is a, here is a solution in summary. We have to be alert to the context and uh, think, um, for example, with the word party. And in, in it has at least three main meanings in English. I put into my Google Translate, which I pick on, but I still love. It's a great app. I put in, she is not a party to the suit. And in a civil law setting, you know that means she is not one of the people being sued or doing the suing. And poor little Google Translate came up with, ella no es una fiesta en el traje, which means if you don't know Spanish, it's kind of like she is not a birthday party wearing a three-piece suit, that kind of suit. So the wrong kind of suit and the wrong kind of party. And I asked some of you over the course of the week how you would say those three words in your language and just scanning down the list, you can see that the three different kinds of party are translated by three different words in, in all these languages. And so if somebody asks you, hey, how do you say party in Bengali, you probably have to stop and ask, well, it depends, which kind of party do you mean? And as, as interpreters who are human beings and understand more than the AI can understand, we look at the big picture and we just automatically put things in the right context, which a computer program really struggles to do. Um, so we're going to do the 30 words with examples. And um, Miguel, how about I do the first five and then switch over to you, and then I'll just advance the slides for you. Fine. Uh, do you want to mute everybody? Because, we're, because we seem to be getting some background noise from uh, some of the people that don't have their mics muted. Sure. I'm just going to look through and see. Because I tried to find my the way to uh, mute, and I don't see it. Yeah, OK, I can do it. Um, if your mic is on, I'm going to mute you now. Please don't be offended. It's not that I don't like listening to you. It's just uh, one at a time here. We will come back at the end and have some discussion. If you have questions, you're welcome to put them in the chat as we go, um, and then we'll address them at the end. So. The first word is answer. Answer, everybody knows, means to answer the phone, to answer a question. But in a court setting, it can mean a formal written statement by a defendant in a civil case that responds to the points in the complaint and articulate the grounds for the defense. As in, you must file your answer within 28 days. So it's a certain kind of uh, legal document that has to follow a precise format and it has to be inputted into the court in a precise way. Right. And usually, almost always, it has to be an attorney who prepares that. Uh, if you're representing yourself, then you'll probably get it wrong and it'll be rejected. <laughs> Number two, arguments. We all know that arguments can mean just any two people who are mad at each other and, and contradicting each other and fighting verbally. But in court, it can mean the first speech that is given by Let's say it's a, a criminal case. The first speech would be given by the prosecutor, and then the defense would give another speech to the jury um, if it's a jury trial, to the judge if it's a bench trial. Um, and then the first attorney goes back and gives another, another little speech, and those are the opening arguments. And you might hear the phrase in trial, we're going to waive our opening argument, meaning let's just get on with this. We don't have anything to say at the beginning. Let's jump right in and start doing testimony. 
And Miguel, feel free to jump in with anything that comes to mind. As, as I go. Uh, typically, I mean, uh, it's what the attorneys, both sides of the attorneys want the judge or the jury to uh, look at in, in the presentation of the evidence. So that they start slanting their opinion towards uh, what the attorney wants. Right. It is not evidence. It is um, not propaganda, but it's a uh, rhetoric. It's an attempt to correct people. To, to convince people of your side. It's hearsay. Yeah, and the judge will warn the jury, by the way, these opening arguments are not evidence. They are just the opinions of opposing counsel. So they are gonna show two different sides of the same issue. Barr, um, I remember first hearing this in uh, the TV show in the 90s called Moonlighting, um, where they were making jokes about walking into a bar versus passing the bar. This lawyer who was always drinking, his friend said he could never pass a bar and he's like, yeah, but at least I passed the bar. And it's kind of a play on terms with the bar exam that you have to take to get your license to practice law. And so depending on the context, it might be a physical bar like a weapon. It might be the place that serves drinks or it might be the professional association that's sort of quasi-governmental. It's really a professional association, but it has legal authority to decide who gets to practice law in that state. And if you hear the phrase bench and bar, that's sort of a casual uh, name for different uh, organizations and events that bring together the members of the judiciary, the judges and the, and the attorneys, um, the members of the bar. And almost all judges are also attorneys. So judges generally belong to both the bench and the bar. Though there are um, certain cases like in rural areas, at least in Texas, some judges are elected officials who do not go to law school and do not have a license to practice law, but they can hear certain kinds of cases, lower cases. And hopefully they got a little bit of training, but not always. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Uh, bench uh, is related to bar. The bench, of course, can mean a place that you sit down in the park and feed the pigeons and watch the ducks on the pond. Or it can mean the piece of furniture that the judge sits behind that's always raised up high to symbolically indicate authority. And it can mean, in general, all judges as a group. If the judge says you may approach the bench, that means you may walk towards the judge to say something, to carry on some conversation. Yeah, and, and, and right in front of the bench, you've got the well, which also has a nice term to it. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 the, it's the area between the bar, uh, between the a fence that separates the public from the judge uh, and the uh, where the judge is. So that, besides being a big uh, pit where you can get water out of, it's also <laughs> the area between uh, the public and the judges. I'm going to add that to my list for next time. <laughs> I have a pen. Okay, thank you. Um, and then uh, brief can be a kind of underwear. It can mean a short amount of time, or it can be the thing that you carry in a briefcase. Briefcase comes from a case that you carry briefs in back when um, attorneys uh, sort of uh, made those popular. And if you say somebody filed a brief, it means a formal written statement in trial that explains one side's uh, legal perspective and the factual arguments. Um, sort of a judge, this is a summary of what we're going to present so that you can review it in advance and be aware of the issues that we'll be arguing. All right. Number six, do you want to take this one, Miguel, the next five? Yeah. I mean, uh, we're carrying a big burden today, Marco. Uh, <laughs> Not like that in, poor lady. Typically, I mean, uh, in, in the lay terms, I mean, burden is when you're carrying a load or any kind of load that uh, is being carried. But in, in the legal setting, uh, it means that who has the responsibility uh, to bring the evidence that is necessary to win the case. So... In all legal cases, in all uh, court cases, the, it's always the, and not in civil, but in, other than that, it's the uh, attorney that has the, the charge or the obligation to bring all the evidence necessary to convince uh, everybody that uh, beyond a, a reasonable doubt or beyond a, a doubt, uh, what, uh, that what happened truly is what you're saying happened. Yes. So... Uh, and sometimes you hear the related phrase, a standard of proof. The standard means how much evidence you need in a certain kind of case. Yeah, that's the bar that you've got to meet. Yeah. Oh, uh, seven. Here you go. 
I in capital, uh, before I started being an interpreter, I for me, capital was the the city where the head of government in a country uh, resided, uh, or the head of the uh, or the state uh, offices uh, for the state. But uh, it also uh, obviously means I in the the capital letter, which is the uh, uh, the first letter that you put in a sentence or the letter that with which you start a proper name. But in the case of the uh, legal term, uh, it's uh, a case where you're where the death penalty is being seeked. So that's typically called a capital case. All right. And then the office that's mentioned here, some states have something called a, a public defender for capital cases. And that's a special organization of attorneys that cover the entire state when somebody is indigent and on death row, um, they they focus on their case to try to see if anything, if there's anything that's been overlooked or that can be done to stay the execution. A uh, complaint is why I say I mean, uh, when I, my foot hurts, I mean, I'm complaining about my foot. Uh, but uh, in, in, our, in our meaning right here, I mean, a complaint is in, in a civil case, uh, it's who, what the, the reason is for bringing, whatever happened to a trial. Uh, I mean, it's the summary of what uh, somebody's grievance is. Uh, and it also has got the several connotations uh, as used with it. I mean, it's a formal uh, pleading uh, that you put in to say what the complaint is. In civil cases, it's the person who is suing you. Uh, he's the one who's going to lodge the complaint. Uh, in in criminal cases, I mean, uh, the complaint is uh, also I mean, what the peace officers found that somebody had done wrong. All right. Thank you. Continuance. Continuance. I mean, uh, when something stops, I mean, uh, and then you want to start it up again, I mean, then it's going to continue, and that's uh, one terminology. Uh, but. Uh, I mean, it's quite often used in our everyday uh, lay terms. I mean, uh, under a, a rental lease, I mean, uh, when it's going to be continued or not. But in in the case of the legal terms, uh, continuance means that we're going to stop for today, and we will meet again uh, next week, next month, or next year. I mean, uh, depending on when the availability is. Uh, and a lot of times, I mean, the attorneys will go in there and say that they need a continuance. The typical one that they always normally get approved for is when they've just been hired. So when they go and they ask the judge, hey, uh, your honor, I, uh, I need some time to, to get myself familiarized with this. So I need a continuance. And normally they get a two or three week uh, uh, extension period. All right. I remember the first time I heard this, I couldn't understand because in my mind, continuance meant like the hearing that we're in now is just going to continue and continue. Are we going to continue after lunch or what? But no, the continuance was for skipping ahead six weeks until a different date, a different docket. Well, it came in my mind. That's uh, when you're watching a TV show and it says to be continued. Right. To be continued. OK, counsel. I mean, counsel. Uh, normally, it's when I give advice or, or ask for advice. Uh, and it's saying you go or you get some counsel from the therapist or a psychologist or from your parents or your friend. But in the legal term, it's uh, it's the attorney uh, or the lawyer who's conducting the case. Uh, and it's used as a title, a generic title of their position. And you don't say the word the in front of it or um, I always I'm always. Uh, it's curious to me that they'll say uh, counsel. They just use counsel as a form of direct address. Like instead of saying Marco, they'll look at you and say counsel. Um, like some people will, instead of saying your honor, they'll turn to the judge and say judge. Um, but it's both a title and a way of referring to the counselor at law. Yeah, it becomes the name of the position rather than the person. Yeah. Okay, I'll take these next five. Uh, account um, can be to count numbers. Um, it can be that something counts as in something matters. Those are normal uses. Um, but in a in an indictment or an information or some other charging instrument 
Oh, charging instrument. That's a good one to add to the list. I keep thinking of others that fall into this category. Um, and a charging instrument account would be how many times you did something wrong. So maybe you were charged with um, Grand Theft Auto and it's four counts because you've stole four different cars. And so if they say, are you going to plea on the two counts of aggravated assault, that implies the prosecutor claims that there were two different times when you assaulted somebody um, with, uh, in an ag uh, with aggravation. But it's not only the number of times for the similar, for the same case, it can also be several things that you did wrong. Uh, so the first count might be that you broke in, the second count might be that you hit him, and the third count might be that you stole something. So in each one of those charges, if they're all related in the same trial, then each one of those is a different count. Right. So maybe we're, we're, we're keeping this entirely in English until the end. If, if the Spanish interpreters want to ask us Spanish questions at the end, that's fine. Um, but for now, whatever question, whatever language you work in, think about what would I say to indicate um, each of the crimes in a list of crimes that I'm being accused of. And it's probably not the word that's normally translated as count. That would be in Spanish, cargo. Number 12 is court. Um, we all know the general meaning of court. And also sometimes people will say, I have court next month. And what they mean is I have a hearing or a trial in the courthouse. Um, but the special meaning that I want to highlight today is court used as a synonym for judge. And you can direct, the, direct uh, your comments to the court. And sometimes the court speaks in the third person, sort of like interpreters say uh, the interpreter needs to make a correction or um, the interpreter stands by his rendering. Um, judges will do the same thing, speaking about themselves in the third person, saying the court as sort of the abstract institution. And also when I'm trying to get uh, my girlfriend to give me a kiss. <laughs> You're courting her. Uh, discharge. Discharge has many meanings. Um, we say that she was discharged from the hospital. If some fluid is leaking out of some part of your body, that's called a discharge. In a law enforcement setting, that often means the discharge of a firearm, it means shooting, a gunshot. And if somebody is discharged from prison, um, that means that they are set free. And then uh, a financial, sort of a civil law meaning of discharge might mean that uh, you owed money, but they closed out the account and you were discharged from the liability for that debt, you don't have to pay it anymore. And in our case, I discharge is when the uh, accused is very happy because then I mean, they're gonna erase the case. Right, you have no criminal record if you were discharged from criminal case. I mean, you probably do, but not for that particular charge. <laughs> or, or not with a sentence. Right, right. Uh, discovery. Discovery usually means to find something important, like um, Columbus discovered the new world. Um, in civil cases, it means that you have to uh, reveal your evidence to the other side beforehand to give them time to research it and figure out how they're going to respond to it. And I remember learning this as a teenager in the comedy My Cousin Vinny, um, where this lawyer who was like totally incompetent goes down to try to get his cousin out of jail. He's from New Jersey and the case is in Georgia or something. And the opposing counsel tells them just casually, hey, so if you want to um, see all of our evidence, just let me know. And, and Vinny says, or whoever the lawyer is, like, Marisa Tomei and, and who's the little guy, Danny DeVito, I think. He's like, what? Yes. You, would, you would give me all your evidence? He didn't even realize you could ask for that. <laughs> And it's, we call it discovery because you're revealing something important, but it should really probably be translated in most languages as exchange of evidence or revelation of evidence, something like that. Relevant information, background, not, general information. It may not even exist as a part of the legal system in the country whose language you are interpreting. It might just be a feature of, yeah, Joe Pesci, thanks might just be a feature of um, common law countries like the US and England. File can be a tool that you use for fixing your nails or filing down a sharp edge of a piece of metal. It can be a folder, a cabinet, a drawer for putting papers in. And to file something in the legal sense means that you formally submit some petition or motion or pleading to a court clerk who officially enters it in the court record and makes it available to the judge. 
um, or it can be used in a context like e-filing where the same thing is done electronically online. So take what's, the next one? what's the next one, Mike? Mine? Uh, do, you want, do you want to take a uh, 16 in, information? Information, I mean, in general terms, information is just knowledge, uh, data. Uh, and uh, all the information technology uh, versed people know that that's uh, all the 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 bits and and bytes in a computer, but uh, it's also a, a form of by where a person is being accused. I mean, a person uh, is can even either be of uh, indicted, uh, which means that a grand jury which is a group of people that are uh, a, gr a group of citizens that decide that the charges or the, the evidence that was uh, found is enough to uh, seek a trial. But uh, if it's not, if it did not come through a grand jury, then uh, it's normally called a charge or an, or an information. And typically uh, that gets read in a criminal case, it gets read at the very beginning uh before everything else starts i mean uh they read the information saying what all the different counts you're being you're being accused of uh to be set in trial and miguel i feel like uh, an information and an indictment are so similar that in some languages they're probably translated with the same term right yeah i don't think uh many of us are familiar with the fact that uh, some cases i mean, they go through a pre-trial decision-making process saying for a group of your peers decide whether there's enough uh, to justify taking you to trial or not, which is what the grand jury is. I mean, for me, that that was one of the first things that uh, that threw me for a curve. I mean, as an interpreter, I mean, what the heck is a grand jury? I mean, as far as I was concerned, it was just a big court uh, and and not uh, and not just a, a group of people deciding whether or not they were going to be bringing, uh, bringing you to court or not. All right. Motion. A motion. I mean, when I'm in motion, I mean, uh, I can be moving around back and forth. I mean, one way or the other. Uh, or when I mean, as, as it's mentioned right there, I mean, uh, when a planet goes around the sun, it's in motion and the motion it's described as an ellipse. But uh, in, in the legal terms, a motion is a proposal uh, or a request that is placed uh, be before the court. Uh, it can be a motion to throw out a case. It could be a motion that I don't want to be your attorney anymore, or it could be a motion to dismiss, uh, or a motion to ask the court to give to issue an order telling you that you have to uh, comply with that activity, uh, or else you'll be disobeying the court and facing uh, charges for disobeying the court. All right, number eighteen is offense. I mean, as you've got right there in the uh, in the image, I mean, you've got the offense versus the defense in a football game. Uh, but in the case of a, of a criminal, in case of a court, I mean, the offense is actually the, the reason why you're being in court. I mean, the, the offense is whatever it is that you did wrong that violated the, uh, the law. So I mean, you're, that, that's what you're facing in a criminal case. I, I can't even explain the difference between offense and offense. Like I, I just have a feel for the meaning of each pronunciation, but they're spelled the same and they, they have different meanings. I imagine that's, that takes a while to learn if English is your second language. Um, offense versus offense. Yeah, one is an action that you're doing and the other one is a group or, or a setting. But when I when I interpret into Spanish, I use a word that means crime for the English word offense. If we're talking about something that you've done that violated the criminal law. Number 19 is party. And that's one that uh, everybody has probably been getting the the emails that Marco has been or the uh, the texts that Marco has been uh, circulating, uh, giving the different meanings of party. Uh, you've got the legal party. You've got the uh, the boosting and dancing party, uh, and uh, but in the case of the legal uh, uh, setting, the party is one of the two uh, par uh, persons or entities that are involved in a fight, uh, and in uh, 
in a civil case, I mean, you've got two parties. Uh, and you've got one, the one who claims that something was wrong and the one uh, who says that, uh, no, I did not do that wrong. I did not hurt him in any way, uh, either economically or physically. I mean, uh, so each of those two uh, individuals or entities uh, would be a party to the case. Miguel, as court interpreters, are we a party? No. We're always independent. We're always uh, transparent, so we can never be a party. And we have to be very careful to maintain our interpretation, uh, reflecting that. So if, you're, if your wife had to go to court, could you be her interpreter? Uh, if she's filing a divorce against you, no. <laughs> but uh, if she was filing uh, the supermarket for a sip and fall, then yes, you could be uh, uh, an interpreter for that. Okay. Number so it's two. everything, depending on the, uh, on the situation, I mean, on the context. Yeah. Number 20 is plea. Go I'm ahead. Plea. I mean, I'm asking you please to believe me and to pay attention to what I'm saying, uh, which is uh, uh, begging, uh, begging you to do something for me. Uh, so you're pleading your, your case. Uh, in, in the case of in the legal and terminology, uh, a plea is what you're proposing as an answer. Uh, so you can, uh, plea, uh, that, uh, the judge, uh, grant you something, uh, or, uh, I mean, it can, it also takes on another meeting when, uh, and probably a lot of you have, uh, participated in plea bargains, which is basically a negotiation or a settlement between the two, uh, either the government and you, I mean, saying, well, I mean, you've been accused of uh, running a red light and uh, you can plead uh, guilty or you can plead no contest or you can plead innocent. And uh, each one of those carries uh, a, a, a set road through which you're going to be going. Uh, and a plea bargain is basically when you agree with the, with the DA or with the attorneys that, uh, OK, you ran the light. But uh, if you pay this and you promise not to get any more uh, tickets, we will forgive it and uh, and erase it from your record, or at least not uh, not leave it there as a as a uh, 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 as a blemish. And it might be there still unless you get it expunged, but uh, you were not found guilty of the offense. All right, thank you. So it it looks like. Um... Like you're begging, but really it's not in a context of begging as it's used in court. It's more a statement about your how you're representing your guilt. Are you guilty? Are you innocent? Or are you not going to contest the charge? The word prejudice is often used uh, socially to mean something like bias or racism, um, jumping to conclusions about somebody else. And it can be used that way in the terms of a jury. If an attorney lets something slip out that was um, not supposed to be mentioned in trial, then that can prejudice the jury and make them decide in advance uh, whether somebody is guilty or innocent without having heard all the evidence. But with prejudice and without prejudice are special uses of the word that mean um, having the right or not to refile the case again, the claim in a different court. Um, whether it's closed forever or whether the the legal action can be pursued elsewhere. Yeah, you're saying uh, if you've uh, I don't know whether you've all seen a movie uh, double double job jeopardy uh, where the woman has been accused and found guilty of murdering her husband. And uh, afterwards, I mean, uh, several years later, uh, they make a big point of the fact that she could kill him and uh, and the law could not do anything to her because she had already been found guilty for killing him. Oh, and he wasn't a dead at all. <laughs> he was still alive in the movie. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. No, I haven't seen it. Uh, the record, it can be like a record player record or the records that you keep on your computer and your files. It can be a world record in sports. Um, in the court setting, uh, records used a couple different ways. One of them is, is the same, just a, a file of information, um, but it's also used to refer to the official 
um, transcript that a court reporter types and then transcribes in, in full of everything that's said and done in court. And it's used in phrases like going back on the record, meaning the court reporter is going to start typing again, or going off the record, which means we're going to have kind of a sidebar. We're going to talk unofficially before the court reporter starts typing everything. And as far as we're all concerned, it affects us very significantly, uh, at least most of us, I guess. Uh, in, in Texas, we have two levels of interpreters. You can be a basic interpreter or a master interpreter. And the basic difference is that if it's a basic interpreter, you're not allowed to uh, formally interpret anything in a court of record, which means a court where they do write down everything that's happening. But if you're a basic interpreter, then you can you can uh, interpret it to court as long as it's not at the higher level of courts, I mean, which means it's only justice of a peace or something like that, uh, which is uh, not a court, not a court of record. Right. And if you get in our case, if you get booked to interpret in a court and you're a basic level interpreter, you have to go to the website and see is this a court of record or not to see if you're allowed to take that case. Or you can always ask the judge saying, Your Honor, I'm uh, just a basic interpreter. If this is a, uh, uh, do you allow me to interpret or not? And the judge can give you permission to interpret also. Number 23 is reporter. Uh, on the left, we have a court reporter. And on the right, we have a very different kind of court reporter in those photos. Uh, one is a journalist, like a newscaster, a news anchor, or a writer for the paper. Um, the other one is a stenographer or a certified shorthand reporter. You'll see the acronym CSR. And we, we like court reporters as interpreters. They're our friends because we want the same thing. Both of us are trying to get people to slow down, speak clearly, and not talk over each other. <laughs> and so the first person you want to make friends with in any deposition or hearing is the court reporter. Give her or him your business card so she can write it down, spell your name correctly and then uh, make friends and uh, help each other out. And there's several types. I mean, you see some people, some recorders are going to be with a little machine, as you see in the picture right there. But other recorders, you're going to see that they put on like a uh, like an oxygen mask in front of their mouth. And they're they're repeating everything that is being said into the little mask. So it records their voice. Yeah, that's the, the new technology. It's um, speech recognition, and they're repeating it in a way that's clearer than the people around them are talking. So if um, you hear somebody say, uh, "This is," I'm calling from a reporter agency or a reporting agency, that's probably court reporters who have been asked to arrange for both a freelance reporter and a freelance interpreter to cover the same event. Reset can be to set again, to set the table again, to set the clock again. And uh, use in the courtroom, it probably means a rescheduled hearing, like, um, can we get a reset for the second week of December? That means, can we reschedule this hearing, trial, appearance, whatever it is? And it can also be just a, a few minutes. I mean, uh, a lot of times uh, a, when, the, uh, when the court calls the cases in the docket call, uh, a lot of times the the uh, attorneys will say, can we be placed on reset on recall or reset? Uh, I mean, which means that they're going to be giving a, a few minutes and then come back. And this is related to the term we saw earlier for continuance. And in some contexts, continuance and reset are interchangeable. Sometimes they are used a little differently. A sentence can be a complete uh, thought expressed in words with a capital letter at the beginning and a period at the end, or it can be the punishment that's given to a defendant after being found guilty in trial. And it's probably not the same word in whatever target language you're interpreting into. So think carefully about the meaning when you choose the word for sentence. Um, 24, 25, 23. Yeah, this one should say 26. Just pretend it says 26 there. Uh, Miguel, do you want to take this one? Okay. Uh, a service, I mean, it's when I'm helping in the church or whether I'm helping with a social uh, setting uh, that I go and I work for a while or I help him with something. Uh, so then, or when you're just help, being uh, helpful in your house, I mean, uh, you're being, uh, of, you're doing a, a service right there. But in the legal terms, it means that it's the formal delivery of documents ordering you, uh, which is a summon, 
or some other legal uh, document, when they're ordering you uh, or they're telling you formally when you have to be, uh, when the next hearing is or when the trial is going to be, and uh, you have to uh, either accept and uh, be, be there or file uh, something saying that you, you're not going to be there and that you want more time, that you cannot be there at that time. But if you do not obey that summon or service, then uh, the judge is allowed to go ahead without you, uh, which is uh, what is necessary for the judge to go ahead without both parties being represented. So you, you're going to lose out on your window to defend yourself. Yeah. I've gotten served by papers from a local constable because I created the transcription and translation of a police interview of a defendant and they had to present it in trial. And one of the lawyers involved wanted the interpreter translator there on the stand to swear and give my qualifications so that they could trust the transcript I had created. And I was like, come on guys, you hired me to do this. Just send me an email and say, hey, can you come to the trial next week? And I would show up. You don't need to serve papers on me formally with a law enforcement officer. And they're like, yeah, yeah, I know. That's just our procedure. And a lot of times it's basically uh, covering your basis in the ahead of time so that uh, you don't have an excuse saying, well, no, I never uh, got your email. I mean, formally, they, the court knows that you were uh, given notice to be there at that time. All right. Go ahead. Uh, setting, uh, I mean, when you're going to put a diamond on a ring uh, for your engagement, uh, that's uh, the diamond is placed on a setting in your ring. Uh, also, uh, when I mean, you're going to set the table and it's uh, when you're being asked to put in the, the knives and forks and spoons and plates and glasses I mean, in the table. Uh, and... Uh, uh, but in, in the case of, uh, of court is the actual appointment of when you're going to be in, uh, when you're going to be having the hearing or the, or the, uh, trial. Uh, so, uh, it also, when, when it's not a, uh, uh, a trial, I then typically some attorneys can, uh, show up with uh, matters that are not uh, that were not pre uh, scheduled. So then typically the judge will get everything that was already formally scheduled and uh, done first. And that's what uh, uh, you're talking about right here in this phrase, uh, that first you take care of the settings and then uh, you take care of anything that just showed up uh, without being scheduled uh, for that day in that in that court. All right. Number 28 is settlement. Uh, well, I know uh, in the old West movies, I mean, you found that they uh, did a settlement, which means that they created a town uh, back in California, Arizona, Nevada, and all that area, uh, as well as in the East Coast, I mean, when the Europeans first arrived into, the, into America. But uh, in, in the legal setting, it means an agreement. Uh, whether it's uh, to dismiss or whether it's in a, uh, a settlement, I mean, when the, the most frequent case that you see a settlement in is either in uh, accidents or in divorces. So uh, in the case of accidents, it's uh, the amount that has been negotiated. So you reach a settlement where the insurance company is going to pay the kids who were hurt uh, so much money and, uh, it has to be paid into the court because the kid is young uh, and then the court is going to administer that money. Or it can be in a settlement between two people uh, when they have a, a, a legal, when they filed suit illegally, I mean, what, uh, what the uh, agreements was, uh, what the agreements were uh, to reach uh, uh, a finalizing of the case. I mean, okay, I will... I will pay you so much and you will give me the car and then we're all going to be happy again. <laughs> Hopefully. So I think a settlement is kind of like the prize money. If you, if you win the contest, you get the prize. How about stipulate? 
stipulate, I mean, I'm going to stipulate that I don't really know what stipulate means. Uh, <laughs> and what that means, I mean, you stipulate is when you're stating that uh, what is being argued is uh, you accept it as truth. Uh, like right now, I could say I stipulate that uh, that Marco is uh, an, uh, an accepted interpreter, which means that I'm saying you don't have to bring him on and bring all his uh, testimony and his records and uh, where he studied and how many years he's been doing it. You're saying formally that you accept that he is an, uh, an expert interpreter, so uh, you don't have to go through the the whole rigmarole of uh, bringing all the evidence and whether you studied uh, here or there or whether you've been doing this job for a long time. Uh, and uh, in a less formal way, I mean, uh, uh, as the case right there, I mean, in that example, when you, in, in an agreement that you set uh, where you say, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do this if you do that. I mean, so formally they're stipulating the conditions. Uh, so, I mean, the insurance companies, uh, a lot of times, while the court, first of all, stipulates that, yes, they do have uh, jurisdiction uh, when the judge has to decide whether he is entitled to take that case or not, whether he has uh, authority over that matter, uh, being whether it's the, uh, at what level of court it's being handled or in that city or county. Uh, so a lot of times right there, they do stipulate that uh, they have to uh, clearly agree that that the court is uh, able to do that. Uh, but most of the time, it's just to uh, save time and uh, say, well, yeah, you don't have to give me all of Marcos's history. I mean, I, I stipulate that he's an expert interpreter. Yeah. So maybe and great example, Leo. Um, so maybe the word that you want to use in your target language is something that means agree or accept rather than stipulate in the sense of specify. And the final word, you want to do this one? Transcripts. I mean, uh, that's uh, that's a great sign from my college. Uh, I mean, normally uh, in in different. I don't think it's formal. Uh, at least I don't recall formally in many languages. You you don't really have the that. Uh, term uh i uh but uh here in the states uh a transcript is uh the list of all the subjects that you took in college or in the university and uh, what grades you got on them and uh what degree you were you achieved by completing all those but uh uh in in the court it is actually the written record of the court reporter uh uh, everything that was written, everything that was said or, or done in, in the court setting uh, during the hearing or during the trial, uh, everything that the court reporter wrote down about what happened or who, who said what uh, is part of the transcript. And uh, in a depot, typically they start discussing whether the transcript will be ready uh, for in a couple of weeks or 10 days or, or, or whether they need it quicker than that. So basically, it's just uh, the, the actual written record of an event. And these can get really long if it's a, if it's a long trial. Like I'm, my webinar next Saturday is uh, practicing uh, in small groups, practicing interpretation. And I'm pulling samples out of a murder trial transcript that I got online that's over 5,000 pages long, the PDF. So just imagine 5,000 pages. Here's a pretty big book. This is Fundamentals of Court Interpreting, sort of the the Bible for our career field. This is 1,500 pages long, so it's like uh, three of these, and that's just everything that was said at a single trial. And typically during a trial, I know uh, you could uh, the attorney can ask the judge to have the recorder read a piece of the transcript, I mean, which means that they're going to be reading back a portion of what evidence was given or what was being said. Besides these 30 words, there are many more. And just off the top of my head, yesterday I typed up some others that are used in a special way in court or else they look just like another word, like the ones that are in italics are Latin words that might be confused for English words, but they mean something entirely different. So I would just encourage you to make sure you know how to say these 30 in your target language and then start a, a running glossary of your own of words that are used differently by lawyers. 
And just a general comment, I mean, whenever they use a, uh, a Latin term in a, in a setting, uh, whether it's a hearing or a trial, you don't have to translate that. You just say the same word and also in Latin. So you don't uh, don't worry about having to find uh, the meaning, the specific meaning in your target language, unless you want to be uh, unless you want to explain what it means. But that's not your job. So in review, here are the 30 words. Some of you came in after we started, and so now you can see the whole set. And um, I'm going to put up a test on the screen in a minute. If you are on a computer, a laptop, or a desktop, you'll be able to see the, the test because it's built into Zoom. Certain devices won't show it, like an iPad or a Chromebook might not show it. And if, if that's the case, don't worry about it. But for those of you who do see it when it goes up, this is sort of your, your word bank. These are the words that we covered and that I drew the questions from. And this is not a graded test. You will not be kicked out of school if you get it wrong. <laughs> but we will compare our answers at the end. At the end, it compiles all of the responses, and then we'll review them and see um, how many people got them right. So I'm going to go to, let's see, where is it? This bar and put up the polls. Launch the poll. Can you see it on your screen now? Yes. OK. Just go through each person. There's only five questions. Click on the answer you believe is best. And I'll let you know when we're done. Take about two minutes for this. An uncontested matter, Elizabeth, means uh, a question or an issue that nobody is um, in disagreement on. It means something that everybody agrees to. Yes, there are only five questions. Okay, I'm going to share the results now. I am ending the quiz if you hadn't finished it. Sorry. Uh, number one, an individual's answer to a legal declaration or charge is the plea. Good. Number two, the judiciary in general is referred to as the bench. Number three, a violation of a criminal statute, everyone got it right, is an offense. An offense. Offense. Offense, yes, not offense. 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 Offense, offense. <laughs> offense is football. Number four, uh, discharge is the, to excuse from liability for debts. And number five, the responsibility to prove the case is the burden. Uh, the prosecutor has the burden, the plaintiff has the burden, et cetera. Good job, Miguel. I think we, I think we accomplished our purpose. Almost everybody got 100%. Okay, good. Well done. Um, we are about to wrap things up here. I want to mention that um, years ago, uh, I got this neck wallet from Tajit that said interpreter on it, and I liked it, but the print was kind of small, and now it's all worn out. And so just uh, this week, I ordered new um, badges. It's like a, a neck wallet that you can put your credential in, and it says interpreter real big on the front. And um, you can also carry your phone and a pen and and different things in there that you need for court. And so if you would like uh, one of those, um, I will put up the link in chat. I'm selling these for $10. And let me copy these links here. There, there's all the links. Um, and um, I would also like to, if you missed it before, draw your attention to Raices, uh, the charitable organization that we are supporting with uh, this month's webinars. I have opened an online school for my training. Like after I do a webinar, I convert it into an online course and I put it on training.texantranslation.com. If you'd like to look at that, you can um, create an account there and it'll notify you when a, when a new course is launched. I'm planning to launch three more courses this week. Uh, there's a closing survey there, so it's feedback for Marco. It's just to ask you what you thought of the webinar today, and if you have any suggestions, I always learn a lot from your feedback. And if you have WhatsApp and you'd like to be a part of our ongoing conversation, we have a little WhatsApp thread that we started two weeks ago where we share ideas and ask questions, and you can say things like, hey, where's the Zoom link? I didn't get it, and somebody will put it in there for you. Um, Mark, I lost page before click. That's okay, Saida. I had to close yeah, the poll before I could show it to everybody. Okay, this is, what is this? Gucci, um, what is that? What this is what? The um, feedback webinar? 
It says the webinar was, oh, okay, I, I understand now. Oh, I, I use funny slang words on the feedback yes. survey because we're interpreters <laughs> yes. and we should know all the funny slang, right? Yes, I know, <laughs> I know now. Okay, so you can just go by the number of stars if you've never heard those words before. I've never heard of Rago, 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 I don't even know how to say that. Okay. 